Hello, and welcome to Exploring Entrepreneurship, New Year, New Biz. My name is Alicia Palacios-Woods, and I'm the President and CEO of the Austin Young Chamber, and I'm excited to be your moderator today. Exploring Entrepreneurship is a partnership between the Austin Young Chamber and the City of Austin Economic Development Department Small Business Program. At the Austin Young Chamber, we help our business community thrive by supporting the young professionals in our region, whether they be entrepreneurs, managers, or early career professionals, aligning resources and programs to create opportunities. Young professionals are the largest and most diverse generation in the U.S. labor workforce, so we know the work we do is important to shape the future of our region and our nation. Keep an eye on the Austin Young Chamber website and social channels for additional programs, pitch competitions, and topics to support your business. And if you're not a member, consider joining to receive year-round benefits for your business. We are so pleased to be able to work with the City of Austin to bring forward several programs that support early stage startups and small businesses here in Austin. Please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Mayo with the City of Austin Economic Development Department Small Business Program to share a few quick words. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to the first installation of our Exploring Entrepreneurship series. Um, I want to thank the Austin Young Chamber for this awesome partnership that we have with them. Um, we bring these programs to you to make you a better entrepreneur, to help you think outside the box, and just to set you up for success. Um, we never want to see a business not be a business. So the Austin Young Chamber and our partnership, we, we are so very proud to be part of that. Just a few things before I turn it back over to Alicia. Um, the tomorrow as a part of this whole new year of you wanting to start a business, the small business Depart uh, division is offering a starting a business in 2020 20 class it's from 10 to 11. And also next week, um, January 24th through January 28th is small business fundamental week. This week is tailor made for anyone who is thinking about starting a business, wanting to start a business, ready to start a business. We have a whole week of classes that are geared towards putting you in the right frame, frame of mind so that you can look at your new business startup. Also, we have just a plethora of classes that we provide training for our small businesses and entrepreneurs um, just to fine tune, including how to write a business plan, social media, small business financing workshops, um, as well as classes for people who are um, wanting to start a cooperative, creative classes, as well as some nonprofit business classes. So we hope you'll visit our website at www.smallbizaustin.org. And um, we really look forward to seeing you in our classes and becoming part of our large network of small business and entrepreneurs. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Jackie. So when it comes to setting up a business, there is a seemingly endless stream of need to knows. From legal business formation to accounting considerations to state filings, these foundational must-haves are a critical part of young businesses. Today, we will take a deep dive into these topics with our expert panelists. Our format will include a one-hour panel followed by 30 minutes of roundtable networking in our virtual platform. Our goal is to make this session as informative for you as possible. We will start with questions that have been pre-submitted by attendees. If you have a question as we go, please drop it in the Q&A tool on the right of your screen so I can ask them to our panelists in real time. And we will try to get through as many questions as possible. Also feel free to be active in the chat as well. So with that, let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Ryan Pitalak is the CMO and founder at Zen Business. He is responsible for building and promoting the Zen Business brand to the new wave of independent workers and entrepreneurs so they can start, manage, and grow their new businesses and pursue their dreams. Ryan has over 20 years of experience in the digital marketing space and is passionate about leading innovation for the industry. Welcome, Eric. Welcome, Ryan. Christy Mondrique is an attorney who dedicates her practice to resolving state and federal tax controversies and litigation. Christy has handled IRS cases involving substantial corporate, individual, and estate taxes. 
Her state tax experience includes disputes arising under Texas franchise tax, sales and use tax, fuel taxes, severance taxes, motor vehicle sales tax, and other state taxes. Christy is also a CPA. Welcome, Christy. Eric Romberg is a senior counsel attorney at Jackson Walker's Austin office with a practice focused on investor representation in hedge fund and private equity fund investments and corporate and securities matters. His experience includes representation of both acquirers and targets and a variety of business combination transactions. Welcome, Eric. And thank you all for joining us today. We're gonna to start out with a few questions just to kind of get to know you better and what your everyday work life is like. Um, we'll start with you, Ryan. Congrats on Zen Business becoming Austin's newest unicorn company in 2021. As a founder, why was it important for you to start Zen Business as a tool for entrepreneurs and what need did you see to do that? Yeah, um, thanks for having me here. Uh, so, I mean, I think that the primary problem that entrepreneurs deal with is how to kind of cross over this chasm from idea to whatever they deem to be success. And so for us, we really uh, try very hard to empower our 250,000 customers with the information they need and the tools that they need to be successful. And so obviously this starts with like a, a business um, formation and, and, and that's the most basic building block, but then having, you know, an integrated set of tools to, to manage the business and, you know, build a web presence and find customers and things like that. And that's really where I think, you know, getting to that point around being successful and actually finding customers, you know, that's the piece we really wanted to try to help our customers unlock. Thanks, Ryan. Christy, we know that setting a good foundation to start is important for any business, and there's certainly a lot to consider when it comes to taxes. Tell us a bit about how you work with businesses of all sizes when it comes to taxes and tax law. Well, Mondrick and Associates, it focuses our practice on state and federal tax controversies and litigation, which means that most of the time we're working with clients, we're involved in either trying to find a uh, taxability ruling from the comptroller's office uh, through a private letter ruling process, or uh, they've already identified an issue. They're going through voluntary disclosure to try to get some penalty and interest waiver, or they've been notified of an audit or of some other assessment, either by uh, the state or the federal government. And we represent them through that process, through responding to the IRS, uh, resolving the tax issues. And this allows us to really learn about a lot of the traps for the unwary, a lot of the things that small businesses get uh, into trouble with and have difficulty um, figuring out. And so that puts us in an excellent position in situations like this to kind of share what we've learned from our practice with the community. Thank you. Eric, we know that no business can grow without first being legally formed. And there are a lot of options on how to do that based on businesses' goals. Tell us a bit about how you and the team at Jackson Walker help businesses get up and running. Sure. Thanks, Alicia, and, and happy to be here. Uh, you know, one of the first things that we will do with, with an entrepreneur is to is to really sit down and discuss what the type of business is and, and what the eventual goals for the business are, because that can have a, a huge effect on the type of legal structure and the complexity of the legal structure that you may need uh, over the life of the business. Whether, you know, you you are intent on starting, for example, a food truck and, and you just want to make sure that you have limited liability in case somebody sues, a simple uh, one member LLC will do the job uh, as compared to the other end of the spectrum if you are, you know, developing a patent or or something that you hope to to work through several rounds of venture financing and then an, an IPO or an acquisition exit, you have, you know, the structure there is going to be a bit more complicated. Um, and so we, we really like to help you try to start planning for the end of the journey at the beginning um, in our business formations. Perfect. Thank you. Well, we had a lot of questions submitted by attendees before today's event, and a lot of them were around the 101s of business formation. How do I get started? So question number one that I'll pose to all of you is, how do I actually form as a business? What do I need to do first if I'm an entrepreneur? So I, I'll just jump in for the very first part of that, which is to, to form a business entity. 
uh, you will need to, to make a filing with the Secretary of State. It's a certificate of formation or a certi certificate of incorporation, uh, depending on the form of the business entity that you choose. And then for federal tax purposes, um, a lot of times businesses will get an, a business tax ID number. Um, the, the entity, like an LLC, even though it is filed on a form Schedule C of a 1040, is a separate legal entity. So it would need its own tax ID number as a federal entity. Um, and then there are are also requirements for filing with the Texas Comptroller's Office. All of the entities that have limited liability protection are required to register to file franchise tax reports. Those might be no tax due reports if it's a very small business, or they might uh, have some other format, but they have to file those and public information reports to avoid losing their corporate privileges each year. I guess I'll that, um, I mean, certainly, like, if you don't want to do this yourself, you know, Eric mentioned going to the Secretary of State, that's, you know, an efficient path. Uh, you know, you can work with an attorney or an accountant who will um, be able to put those filings together for you, especially, like, if you're getting into the ballpark of um, raising money and going to have investors and, you know, there's more partners and things start to get more complex, like, it can be helpful as you're agreements start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, and then, you know, we work with a lot of um, solopreneurs who, you know, might not want to go through the Secretary of State and just want someone to manage the filing process for them kind of cheaply and efficiently. Um, so there's lots of options. Perfect. Christy, you mentioned a federal tax ID. How do you go about getting that? Well, there are a few different options. Um, right now, probably the uh, quickest option would be at irs.gov. The IRS has opened more e-services available to taxpayers. Um, one of the old fashioned ways of doing it is to fax file a request for an EIN or to call the IRS and get one assigned. And um, right now, the hold times with IRS can be astronomical and sometimes you don't even get connected on certain days. So. Uh, the best way is probably to go through the e-services because you've also probably heard about the truckloads of mail that were piling up. Apparently, they've gotten through all those, but still, it's taking a really long time for snail mail as well. So definitely check out the online options. Might have to have some information with you to verify some details about who you are and what your filing status has been in the past. So get that stuff ready and, and check it out. Awesome. Thanks, Christy. Okay. I know we talked about, I think Eric, you talked about a different ways that a business might form depending on their goals. Um, what is the difference between an LLC, a partnership and a corporation? And then question to the group, how do each impact taxes? Um, what are some key considerations people should think about when forming one of these entities? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying that in, in a lot of cases, this really is driven by tax because of the, the differences in how these entities are taxed. Um, there are some differences in corporate governance uh, at these various entities. I'll try to avoid um, giving some kind of law school dissertation here, <laughs> but uh, to, I'll try to simplify as much as possible. Um, so an, a limited liability corporation is a, is a very flexible entity that, uh, you know, outside of some pretty specific uh, types of businesses and types of, of exits that people are looking for, the, the limited liability company is really my sort of recommended most flexible, easiest to deal with type of entity. Um, it can have uh, it can have members who are the uh, analogous to stockholders, so the equity owners of the of the business. It can be managed by those members, or it can be managed by a board of managers, who, who, which is analogous to the board of directors of a corporation. Um, really, the 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 thing that is attractive about LLCs is the the wide variety of flexibility in in the structuring the governance, structuring the relationship between the various members of the of the entities, and also the ability to just be incredibly simple if incredibly simple is all you need. Um, partnerships, you know, 
the people used to go into general partnerships uh, that that is rare these days for the for the reason that uh, general partners remain liable to you know for basically everything that they have and so that the whole purpose really of of most of these entities is to limit the liability of the owners or operators of the company to what they've invested in the company um and to, so so that people feel empowered and freed to to uh try try these businesses and, and create new businesses um the corporation has a has a much more formal structure it, it always has to be uh governed by a board of directors that's elected by the stockholders um the you know there there are there is significant flexibility with with corporate structure but not not as much as an llc to be honest um and the uh I think that's a I think that's a good overview of the corporate governance structures of those entities. But the, the point is they all provide for limited liability for the owners and investors in the business. So that if they're if some if the business is sued for some reason, the the plaintiff can't reach the personal assets of the owners of the business. Perfect. Ryan or Christy, anything to add? Just add that for tax purposes, several of these entities like LLCs, the um, default is for them to be flow through. So basically the entity files an information report and the um, individual reports those amounts on uh, the tax return for the members. Um, and then for a corporation, there's a double layer of tax. Um, there's the tax at the corporate level. And then when the money's taken out as div dividends, there's tax again at the shareholder level. Um, but the other piece would be, uh, there's an S corporation, which is kind of a hybrid. Um, it does file an information report. It issues a K-1, but it's required to send, to pay its members a reasonable wage. So the S corporation shareholders have to meet really stringent requirements. We might talk about that later in the presentation. Thanks, Christy. I know that when I read contracts, something that comes up often is indemnification. And one of our attendees has flagged that as well as something that they don't understand. What the heck does indemnification mean? Um, can one of our lawyers <laughs> please help enlighten us um, as to what this means? Sure. Yeah, there, there, uh, I agree. It appears in everything. And, and there, there are a number of, of different sort of varieties of it, but I'll, tr I'll try to just come up with the most garden variety I can say that, that, uh, let's see, say that I agree to, I agree to fix uh, somebody's fence for them. And in the process of fixing that fence, I damage the, the, uh, property of an, of a neighboring, uh, landowner. And that landowner sues the person that hired me. If they were, if the if the person that hired me was smart, they would have included an indemnification clause in the contract between myself and and the landowner, that if I cause damage, that that losses to the to the to the person who hired me, uh, as a result of my negligence or or whatever, uh, I would be on the hook for paying the damages that they suffered as a result. So it's a, it's a, a basically in a, in a contract, if I cause, if, if my behavior causes damage to the other side for, for a variety of reasons, that's me, I'm, I may have to indemnify the other side, that is make them whole for the damage that I caused. Perfect, thank you. Um, so with, with state filings and tax forms and checking accounts and other items that it takes to get your business up and running, approximately how much does it cost? And maybe what's like a general timeline that one can that one can expect to get up and running, Ryan. This may be a good one for you with your yeah, business. yeah. I mean, the reality is, if you go to the Secretary of State, you're not going to pay uh, incremental fees. So, like at its core, you have a state filing fee. Um, for example, state of Texas, I think it's three hundred ten bucks. Um, Kentucky, it's Fifty-five Illinois, it's like five hundred. So it just depends on where you want to incorporate. I mean, most people here are going to incorporate in Texas. It's a it's a good state to incorporate in typically. Sometimes, like if you're going to do a 
a C corp with investors, maybe you might file in the state of Delaware. Um, but with respect to the actual price, I mean, so if you go to the Secretary of State, you know, it's effectively not any incremental money. Um, a service like ours is 49 bucks or more. You know, attorneys are certainly going to be, you know, more um, uh, than that. And so it just really kind of depends on what your needs are and if it's complex or, or not. Anything to add? No, I think that I think Ryan captured it well. Fantastic. So once you're formed as a business, certainly you need to set up a business bank account. How do, how do you go about doing that? What does the process look like? I can get going here. So, um, and then I'm hand it up. I mean, there's a lot of options with respect to bank accounts now. I mean, you know, you have the traditional like Bank of America and Chase type bank accounts, um, which is largely what people do you know they're looking for a local branch or you know frost you know frost here um you know is kind of picky with respect to like who they'll approve for business banking which is um something to think about like you know whereas if you go to a major bank um just much more likely to get easily approved uh, which is odd that you have to get approved for a bank account, but you do. And then um, you're looking for like, what are the range of services that they provide? Like if you're going to handle cash, how easy is it to deposit it? And obviously be able to take money out. Um, some of the like more digital banks, um, you know, they're not going to have that physical presence. And so the question is, is that important to you? Lending facility, like are, are you going to have the opportunity to get a loan um, is typically something people will think about. You know, frankly, as a new business, getting money from a bank is incredibly difficult. Um, they're kind of not very likely to give you money out of the gate. I mean, over time, like once you have revenue coming in, um, that's possible. But, you know, that as being like one of the core reasons why you'd work with a bank these days, I think is a little bit less important. I think there's more alternatives to getting lending, like Lending Club, for example, is a common way or, you know, some of these other um, uh, digital lending services that, you know, are more willing to take on risk um, at, at, at giving loans to early stage businesses. Perfect. Thank you for that. We do have a question in the chat. So I'm going to jump in with this question for Miguel. Uh, Christy, you may have seen it. Yes, <laughs> do, I did. Do authors who self publish and earn income have to file for tax IDs, sole proprietorship, et cetera? Would this be considered a pass through entity? That's a very good question because uh, a sole proprietorship is basically the individual. And so the individual remains fully liable for any, you know, if, if you're just publishing stuff, unless you're what you're publishing is going to harm someone. There may not be as many um, requirements to protect your limited liability. But um, if you are selling published works, those are considered tangible personal property, whether they're digital or um, in in paper. And so in Texas, you'd be responsible for filing for a sales tax number, even though you aren't required as a sole proprietorship to pay the franchise tax and register for the Texas franchise tax. Christine? And, and for federal, only if you have employees would you necessarily have to get an EIN for a tax ID number. Awesome. Thanks, Christy. Uh, coming to you, Eric, with some legal questions. Um, just in general, what are some key legal considerations an entrepreneur should keep in mind when looking to form their business? This could relate to IP, trademarks, co-founders, et cetera. Sure. And again, I'm going to give you a, an answer that it, it varies on a spectrum from, from how complex the business is and, and the sort of the industry in which it operates. Um, you know, obviously around here, I've done a lot of work with, with tech focused uh, companies because of the, the strength of the tech ecosystem here. So I'll, I'll mainly discuss that, that area. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the most important things to do in the beginning, in my opinion, is uh, have if you have co-founders being very clear and having some potentially hard discussions with co-founders about ownership of the company um, and, and expectations going forward uh, is I've seen the lack of that occurring cause problems down the road as you get to stages in funding 
um, as the as the business gets traction, that can cause uh, a lot of friction down the road. Um, but so that's one. But the I sort of buried the lead, I guess, on this. The the most important of all is the IP ownership um, in that in that business um, in that type of business. Uh, there's a lot of ways in the in the very beginning uh, when you're developing intellectual property. Um, and especially if you have other people working with or for you, there's a lot of ways that the, the, the horse can get out of the barn in terms of the ownership of that IP. So uh, if you're in that a, a, a business where intellectual property is, is going to be important, uh, the, the most important advice I can give is to make sure that the ownership of that IP is crystal clear from the very beginning. Thanks, Eric. We have a couple of questions in the chat that I'll go to. Um, first one is from Kristen. Um, I'm currently a marketing consultant and freelancer and doing project-based work offering my services. Are there benefits to becoming an LLC if my plan is to do freelance work for less than a year? Who wants to tackle that one? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say something here on this. Um, you know, we work with a lot of solopreneurs. These are people that is just a business of one. Typically, it starts as a side hustle. So this is like exactly the, the thing that you're talking about here. I mean, forming an LLC, paying taxes on it, and dissolving it later, not too difficult. Um, you know, you definitely have liability risk whenever you're providing a service. And especially if you're talking about marketing, you can start to run into some issues where, you know, you might do something with the marketing that the client doesn't like. They might think that you should be liable for doing something to their brand. There's all sorts of potential problems there. Um, just having this layer of protection, the LLC, simple layer of protection, I think is super smart. So... And it's just so easy to put in place. That's my perspective. I mean, someone else might have something to add. Chris, you Eric, anything to add? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, the, I, the, it's a, it's a very, uh, very inexpensive insurance for what could be a, a big bill at some point. And to Ryan's point, you know, for, for very simple things, filings like a very simple LLC, you don't have to come to somebody like Jackson Walker and, and pay our fees. It, there, there are service providers that can that can do that for, for much less and it, it's absolutely worth it. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Ryan, we have a circle back to something you mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, you said that it's easier to borrow from digital lending companies. Can you please tell us who some of those companies are? Sure. Yeah. I mean, Lending Club is the one that, you know, I mentioned earlier. Um, it's an interesting model because um, you're putting like your business and your business need up uh, to the to the broader network. And it's a it's become a marketplace lending uh, business. So, you know, institutional investors are actually on the other side and they're bundling up your loans together for the institutional investors in a marketplace model. Um, they're the one that in particular comes to mind to me. Um, Cabbage has tried to figure out this side of the business, but you know, they've struggled a bit with the like less than one year, like you've been in business for less than one year, but you get out of one year, they start to get better at it. Um, there's a lot of, um, it, depending on who you work with. So like, for example, if, um, if you're merchant processor, so there's this thing called, um, uh, Mer it's like merchant advance and so like if you have uh merchant processing through like a square or a stripe or something like this then as you start to get um transactions in there they'll actually loan you money based on what are your projected receivables in the future so even if you haven't like actually you know made those charges but because they know your transaction history um they'll tell you kind of whether or not you've um met the hurdle it's pretty expensive and it's short term but you know those are um, options if you start to get into invoicing like if you're doing lots of invoices consistently there's this thing called invoice factoring um you can just google it and like look for options for that so it just depends like if you're just trying to get money out of the gate and you have no history something like a lending club frankly like a credit card probably those are typically the options 
you know, if you start to get some operating history, that's where you can do some, you know, merchant cash advance or you know, invoice factoring to, to get paid a little bit ahead of the money that you'd otherwise be getting. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Christy, we had some questions submitted from attendees about taxes. Um, namely, where do they start? Uh, they know they have to pay quarterly taxes. How does that work? Uh, maybe just a little one-on-one -on, -one on what to expect here for some businesses that are getting up and running. So it all depends on what your structure is. If you're one of those flow-through entities or uh, and something other than like an S corporation where you're getting a, a wage paid to you where taxes are being withheld, um, any of those situations, you need to provide quarterly estimates of your tax liability throughout the year and pay in. Basically, it's the replacement for the self-employment tax or the um, estimated taxes that you would have withheld from your paycheck if you were an employee. So um, that's something that's done quarterly. As far as um, setting up a business with the IRS, it's going to depend on what type of business you've got. Um, so there are different filing and registration requirements for S corporations. You have to make an election timely. So that's a big issue. Um, and so th those are all the types of things that I usually um, think about when we're talking about what are your obligations. Obviously, if you've got a um, payroll and you've got people working for you, um, you need to also consider uh, the employment taxes. And those are pretty serious taxes because they're withheld from the employee's paychecks and they're held in trust to be paid over to the state. So that's something for which individuals who withhold or are responsible for the withholding accounting and reporting can be held individually liable um, jointly and severally with the entity for those taxes. Perfect. And a quick follow up. Um, one of our entrepreneurs says that she didn't know that she needed to get W-9s to issue 1099s at the end of the year. Um, talk a little bit about that. And also, is there anything else um, that that entrepreneur should do like on the front end in order to make the back end a little bit easier? Well, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's out there that, um, you know, you, you do need to keep up with. The W-9s for the 1099s are uh, important because you do have to report uh, contractor payments to uh, service providers and folks you pay rent to and a variety of other folks. You have uh, detailed instructions that change from year to year at irs.gov. Uh, one of the things that I recommend to people is that um, if they're able to do so, it's always very helpful to have a CPA on board. Now, a CPA is not going to uh, necessarily be looking at everything. Most of the time you hire a CPA to do your federal tax return filing, but they can also help you with other things uh, like the staying on top of the 1099s and the other forms like the W-2s and the W-4s um, to aid with that process as well. It's just that you need to be really careful in your scope of why you hire a CPA because uh, they're not automatically going to take care of all your tax needs. Thanks for that, Christy. Ryan, I know that Zen Business offers a great step-by-step -step option for entrepreneurs in a lot of these pieces. What pre-work should founders have ready to go to use a platform like yours? Is there a rhyme or reason to a timeline and what formation looks like? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we're trying to make it so that um, we could be increasingly valuable to people like earlier before the point of formation. Today, we do that in a couple of places. We have this uh, Zen Business Academy where you can go and look at videos across like business ideation and business idea validation. Um, we're a lot around marketing, customer research, and um, it's at zenbusiness.com forward slash learn. It's free, you know. Um, the pre-work, I mean, honestly, like we created those videos for the purpose of trying to answer this question, but but I'll say that like, you know, if, if anybody uh, is it hasn't read this book, Eric Reese's Lean Startup, I would significantly recommend you read that book. You know, effectively, it's talking about how to create like a. It's effectively like a business a business plan on a page. The key here is talking to actual people, actual customers. That's the getting off the ground. Like the business formation, I kind of think of as being incidental, meaning it's just a part of the what you do as you're going along in your journey. Hopefully, you do it earlier rather than later. The thing that's really meaningful is when you know you start actually doing what you're going to do. Like you're putting your 
product or service together and you're talking to people about it and people are actually interested in buying it. Like that's the, the pre-work in my mind is like actually getting out and trying to be out there, seeing if people are actually going to buy what it is that, you know, you're trying to sell. Fantastic. Thank you. So we talked a little bit about, about uh, 1099s and contractors and one of our uh, attendees is looking to hire. What do they need to know um, about employees versus contractors or, you know, any of the withholding for taxes, health, offering health insurance? Um, what do they need to know to be aware of so they don't violate any of the important rules and laws that exist out there? All right. So I'm going to point you first to a very useful guide at TWC.gov. It's the it's a TWC. It might be state.gov, but TX.gov. But, um, but anyway, the Texas Workforce Commission's website has an especially for Texas employers publication that they keep up to date that has a lot of good resources and tools in it. Um, one thing you should know is that you don't have the option of just deciding whether you're going to have somebody be an employee or a contractor. It's based upon a variety of factors that the IRS and the TWC both publish. Um, and so you need to make sure you understand those factors before making that determination and you communicate well. Um, I would also recommend, uh, even if it's very expensive, um, it's always helpful to have an employment lawyer. Um, I've got one who I call upon when I want to do things like, uh, you know, transition, we transitioned our uh, sick leave and vacation time to PTO, which gives a lot more flexibility, but there are ways to do it, ways not to do it. So um, employment lawyers are immensely valuable. Eric, anything to add to that? Uh, I'll uh, absolutely agree with what Christy said. I, I you know, the, it is once you move into hiring to getting employees, you you are you are moving into a, a new realm of complexity, and it, it, it's a really good idea to to check those resources. And you know, uh, the first thing that I do in situations is is call on one of our employment lawyers, and so I can't can't agree with that more. Fantastic. And in our follow-up email after the session, um, we'll definitely include the links to the resources mentioned today. So you'll get that in an email. Um, Christy, you kind of mentioned and touched on this. Um, it's important to have people around you who can help be a resource and provide advice. There's so many questions that come up for entrepreneurs. So uh, I'd kind of like to hear from each of you, What, who is it important to surround yourself with? What types of people, especially at the beginning as you're starting this entrepreneurship journey and growing a business? Well, some of my important people include my insurance folks. Um, I have commercial liability insurance and professional liability insurance folks. Uh, my IT folks who take care of that sort of thing. Of course, the, the bankers are important to have a relationship with. Um, and then you have a variety of other uh, service providers like uh, the employment lawyers and, and the tax um, advisors, the CPAs. Um, all that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's very helpful to have a team around you. Um, you can't necessarily hire all those positions. So it's, it's important to build relationships with folks who can help you with those needs when they arise. Ryan, what about you? Who, who would you say is important to surround yourself with? Yeah, I mean, there's the people that we, you're kind of like obviously going to think about like accountant, attorney, insurance, et cetera, which I'm not saying it's obvious, but it's like, you know, what you uh, definitely need to have surrounding you. But um, I think like somebody who's been through this before, like a business entrepreneur who gets it and has done, doesn't need to have done your business, but has done the thing of taking an idea and turning it into an actual business. It's, it's, it's amazing how many of those skills actually transfer from business to business. And so you know, you really need somebody like a mentor who you can turn to. Sometimes that's like somebody in your supply chain. So it could be like a supplier or a customer, or it's like literally a family member or a friend. You know, we're trying to add this layer of mentorship in uh, and community to make it so that somebody has someone to connect with inside of our organization for help. Uh, because a lot of times people just don't have anybody in their circle. Um, SCORE is an organization here in town, you know, they'll connect you with folks who, you know, lend their time for free to effectively become your business mentor. So I definitely, you know, I'm sure like y'all probably connect people like uh, definitely you want somebody who's done it before. 
a lot of entrepreneurs in our chamber. So we're happy to be yeah. a resource for you. Thanks. Eric, what about you? Put in the position of agreeing violently with both of our other panelists. So yeah, absolutely. The, the service providers are important. Um, the, and the, the, the mentorship, the, the been, been there, done that, know, know what it's like perspective is, is invaluable. Fantastic. Well, I have one more question for the panel and I'll remind uh, the audience that if you have a question, we'll have, it looks like a couple more minutes. So please do add them to the Q and A tool and we'll try to get to it if we have time. But my last question for each of you is to close with a little bit of advice. Uh, what's one do and one do not that you would like to share with entrepreneurs who are just starting out or maybe even those who are looking to make changes that will help them start right? With that, I, one thing that you don't want to do is presume that you know it all. You want to make sure that even the things that you think you already know about business, uh, especially some of the technical sort of um, setup requirements, that sort of thing, make sure you double check and, and talk to people. And this is also a good way to come up with ideas. But I think using that network and allowing for uh, that a level of communication really can be very invaluable in building a strong business base. Christy, Ryan? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think if I maybe can kind of um, direct my answer in a, in a direction is, um, I, you know, I feel like at its core, what you're trying to do when you're building a business is you're trying to validate whether or not your idea is something that the world cares about. And I think that, you know, there's this validation phase that you have to go through um, that's incredibly important. You can save a lot of cycles, meaning time and money um, on your idea, making sure that you're actually pursuing the right one by you know, getting out and talking with customers, I can't emphasize that enough and, and, and validating it. One of the, you know, mistakes can be just to kind of get after it and get going um, without having actually talked to anybody. And you pick your head up like six months and then realize I have no customers. I don't know what's going on. Like, why is this not working? And the reality is it's, you know, because by the time you actually get to talking to people, they don't care. And um, I think that all can be um, avoided. So I answered a slightly different version of the question, but. That's great. I loved it. <laughs> Eric, anything to add? So what I said earlier, which is if you're, if you're in an IP business, make sure you're protecting it from the beginning. And don't put off difficult, difficult discussions if you have co-founders. Perfect. And Exploring Entrepreneurship is um, a three-part uh, a three part series every year. We did have three um, conversations last year. One of them was on co-founders. So in the follow-up email, we'll be sure to include a link to that conversation, that recorded conversation about uh, what you should keep in mind if starting a business with a co-founder. Um, we do have another question in the chat, so I'll go to that. We have a few more minutes left. Um, what tax or legal considerations do you need to take in account if you plan to do e-commerce? Uh, that's a good one because uh, state and local tax has really expanded post Wayfair case. Um, basically, uh, the most states have moved toward uh, marketplace sort of um, structures where if you are selling through a marketplace, you are uh, engaging in an agreement to have collection and um, remittance of taxes done through the marketplace. However, that may not insulate you from establishing your own individual responsibilities to file in that state. So you do need to be very careful to look at every single state has a different requirement. Um, there are a lot of good resources for that online, uh, Amazon, eBay, and a few others, uh, including the Multi-State Tax Commission and some others have uh, good sources to be able to look at the different uh, nexus requirements in the various states. But um, do be aware that you might be uh, exposing yourself to tax collection responsibilities, even if you don't step into a state by having a certain dollar volume of sales or a certain number of sales within those states. Ryan or Eric, anything to add to that? I think from a from a legal standpoint, it, it could vary greatly depending on what 
what type of e-commerce and and the scale of it um you know it, it could it could be pretty much the same as all the things we've been talking about or or it could involve other other <clears throat> much more difficult questions like you know uh personally identifiable information and things like that 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 could you really need specialists to to discuss perfect well i'm not oh we got one more question that came in so well, let's get to it <laughs> Um, thank you for your time. They say, what kind of advice would you give to someone who did talk to someone who did talk to some people about a product to sell, but have to import the product? What is a good step to get started? I'm not sure that I know exactly what the question is, like how to do importing of the product, if there's legal requirements related to that. I mean, I don't know. I'm going to defer to somebody else on the panel, but I mean, I feel like you just buy it and <laughs> see, I don't know. Somebody else now. Yeah. Again, it would depend on, uh, uh, you know, strongly on what, what the product is, if it, if it's governed by any regulatory uh, regimes here in the United States or, or in the country of origin, um, it could be very simple or it could be quite complex depending oh, on because of tariffs. Yeah scarves for example scarves christy anything to okay. add <laughs> um not really except that if you're buying things from outside the country and selling them here and they're tangible personal property like scarves you'd be responsible for definitely uh, registering for sales tax permit here in texas but um don't know exactly how you plan to sell them or uh what the importation uh, requirements are there's all sorts of copyright, uh, you know, the intellectual property issues, that sort of thing. So just, just be careful. Great. Well, not any more questions. So I want to thank each of you for sharing your expertise with us today. We've definitely learned so much from each of you, um, and I'm sure everybody would love to have you on their teams <laughs> as they start this journey in valuable wealth of knowledge. Um, attendees. It's now time for some networking. We're in a virtual platform, but Remo is fantastic for this. Um, before we let you go, um, we would love to hear your feedback on today's session. So we're gonna post a link in the chat to a two question survey. Please click, click it and take a couple minutes to share your thoughts. Um, and as you're doing that, I just wanted to share what will happen next in the networking. Once we end presentation mode, you'll be able to move from table to table simply by double clicking on the table you would like to move to. Then you can turn your camera and mic on using the buttons you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Each table works like a Zoom breakout room where you can see and hear the people sitting at your table. This platform will be open for roundtable discussions until 1 o'clock p.m. So thanks again for joining us today for Exploring Entrepreneurship, New Year, New Biz. We will see you at the networking tables.